Good morning, church. Go ahead and stay standing for the reading of God's Word. Today we're going to be in James chapter 4, verses 13 through 17. The ushers are coming down the aisle right now. If you need a Bible, go ahead and raise your hands up, and they will be more than happy to give it to you. Uh, if you don't have a Bible at home or if you know somebody that needs a Bible, please take one and give it to them. We are running short on Bibles, and we're going to have to order more Bibles, so it's a good thing. If you have one of our Bibles, we're going to be on page 1013. All right, follow along. Come now. You who say, tomorrow or tomorrow, excuse me, today or tomorrow, we will go to, into such and such a town and spend a year there and trade and make a profit. Yet you do not know what tomorrow will bring. What is your life? For you are a mist that appears for a little time and then vanishes. Instead, you ought to say, if the Lord wills, we will live and do this or that. As it is, you boast in your arrogance all such boasting is evil. So whoever knows the right thing to do and fails to do it, for him it is sin. Let us pray. Father God, thank you for today and just thank you for bringing our church together um, to, to worship you, Father. We pray for Pastor Mike as he preaches a sermon straight out of your word today. And uh, we pray for his Christmas cup and cooler weather. <laughs> keep us safe, keep us blessed. It's all these things that we pray. Amen. 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 Uh, yeah, we're not going to, I guess we'll pray for my cup. Hey, uh, you can have a seat. Yeah, that was, uh, that was cool. Yeah, Andy did notice I, I have a Christmas cup up here. Uh, I brought this last week and somebody put it up here on the, on the podium so I could use it today. And it does remind me that it's cooler other places than it is here in Phoenix. But I'm happy to be here in Phoenix because that's where you all are. So anyways, uh, good morning. My name is Mike. And I get to be the pastor here at Mission Valley Church. If you're new here today, if this is like your first Sunday with us, we're so glad that you're here. I'd love to uh, get to know you, maybe shake hands, fist bump, whatever you're into. So I'm going to be out in the courtyard after service. Love to, to shake your hands, get to know you out there. Uh, if you want something like a little bit like less personal, you don't want to like walk all the way up to me, uh, fill out one of the connect cards that Brian will talk about at the end of the service. Uh, and I'll, I'll, uh, I'll get with you that way. Would love to connect with you. Uh, anyways, so... Uh, People, I think, uh, all of people, all of the you know, people in the world kind of fall into two categories. There's two categories that people fall into. There's the planners and then the spontaneous people, right? There's like the planners and the spontaneous people. There's probably other people, but I don't know who they are. There's like planners and there's spontaneous people. I am a planner. I'm the, I, I fall into the planner category. I like to make a plan. My daughters know that. Uh, they probably shake their head. Like we are getting ready, uh, like 4th of July weekend, we're going to go out of town. We're going to do stuff. And I've already booked like, hey, we're going to eat dinner at this place. We're going to eat lunch over here. And we're going to do it. Like I'm not a spontaneous person. I'm a planner. And then there's other people that are, that are like, that are very spontaneous. They're like up for adventures. And what God does, I think, and sort of a fun little joke that he plays on people is that he has these two kinds of people get married to each other, right? So you get like the super planner uh, married to the super spontaneous person. And then that, that's great. That makes for great family vacations uh, and things go really well. Uh, I just tend to always have a plan. Even when I was a little kid, I was a planner. I was like a little kid, I had a plan. And so, you know, like well, on the, the first day of school, you go to first day of school or you, you, you get in a new group or whatever, and the teacher will start off by asking like these kind of get to know you questions. And one of the get to know you questions is always, where do you see yourself in 10 years, right? And as a little kid, I always had an answer for that. I knew exactly, but well, you just want 10 years because I got like a 15, 30 year plan. Like I, I'll tell you like where I plan on being. I've always just been a planner. And so I started thinking it would be kind of fun just to, ask some of our Mission Valley, uh, some of our Mission Valley kids this same question. I just wanted to share uh, some responses with you. So this is, uh, this is a picture of Kate Nelson. Kate, uh, uh, Kate's mom is Jen, and she runs our kids' ministry program. And it isn't Kate just, she just looks so happy. She's so happy. So I just asked Kate, where, where do you think you're going to be in 10 years? And this is what Kate said. Kate sees herself driving to church after getting lessons from her dad, who has never gotten a ticket, unlike her mom. So that's a good, that's a good church staff kid member throw a little shade uh, on your mom. She plans on being a famous singer, not just a singer, but a famous singer. And so she says that she plans on being a famous singer who sings sometimes with Kobe on the worship team. So like, I guess like sometimes she's going to grace Kobe with her presence when she's not on tour, which I think is great. She's also going to have a, a store that will sell beautiful things like jewelry and pretty things like that. And then on the weekends, like that's what she's going to do just during the week. And then on the weekends, she like in her leisure time, she's also going to be an artist and a scientist. So that's cool. that's what Kate's going to do in 10 years. If you wonder what's Kate going to be doing in 10 that's it. And then I was like, well, I wonder what 
Easton's going to be doing in 10 years. And so there's a picture of Easton. This is Easton Humphreys. Uh, his, his parents, Megan and Brian, just ask Easton, like, what are you going to be doing in 10 years? He's also going to be driving a car. So that means the rest of us have 10 years to get off the road, right? Like, I am I'm just kidding. I, I love Easton. But the thought of him driving does freak me out a little bit. Uh, he's also going to design video games, and he's going to have his own YouTube channel, which is going to be pretty cool. And then he's also going to play baseball and basketball, basketball presumably professionally, and, and that's going to be good. He said he's going to probably buy the church a big building. Um, he didn't say that part. I just added that in. And then this is uh, Andrew Bartolucci. And Andrew, like, talks a lot, but he, we, he didn't, like, converse a lot. And so I just started to imagine, like, what's he going to be doing? This is Kobe and Bailey's little boy. Like, what is he going to be doing? Ten years from now, he's probably going to be doing what he's doing right now, just louder and faster. And so what does he do now? Well, he drives trucks, he works hard, and he plays the drums. And so I just imagine him doing that louder and faster. And so I would ask you, church, as, you just, as you're sitting here this morning, think about this. What about you? What do you think you'll be doing in 10 years? Where do you see yourself in 10 years? It's an interesting thought and something to think about, but according to our text today, the truth is you don't really know. See, if we just look at that text that's, that's out of James that, that, that was just read to us by Andy, if we just look at that text, what we see is that we don't really know what's going to be happening 10 years from now. As a matter of fact, that's sort of our big idea today. The big idea of today's sermon is we don't know what tomorrow will bring. We just really don't know what tomorrow will bring. It is, a, it is a complete surprise to us. It's a complete shock to us. And if you are a planner like me, if you are somebody that likes to plan things out and have a plan for how things go on, this could make you really nervous. But if you are a Christian, I think the fact that you don't know exactly what tomorrow will bring is actually really good news. I find this text to be incredibly encouraging. As a matter of fact, as I look at this text, I think that there are at least five reasons in today's text to be excited about tomorrow, to be excited about the things that we don't know that are happening. And I think that there are five reasons in this text that give us good reason to sing loud to Jesus today. You know, if you're new at Mission Valley, you'll notice that we do the majority of our singing at the end of the service. We didn't forget to sing. We just know that sometimes when you come in here, you're not ready yet. Maybe you had a rough morning. Maybe the kids didn't cooperate. Maybe things didn't go the way that you thought that they should go, and you're just not ready to sing and so we want to remind you in the text that you have good reason to sing and so let's get into it the first thing I want you to know is we don't know what tomorrow will bring so hold your plans with open hands church I want us to hold our plans with open hands because we have no idea what's coming down the road the road look at the text it says this James 4 13 says this come now you who say today or tomorrow we will go into such and such a town and spend a year there and trade and make a profit. Yet you do not know what tomorrow will bring. James is specifically, in this part of the text, as he's writing this letter to these people, he is specifically writing about traveling merchants who would make plans about where they would go next. These are people that are like traveling around and they are selling things. They're making a profit. They're like, well, we're going to go over to this town and, and sell some stuff, and then we'll go over to this town and sell some stuff, and we'll make some money while we're doing that. That's who he's writing to is what he's thinking about. And I understand that it is good to make plans. Right? We've talked about this before. I'm a co-vocational pastor, so I pastor this church, and I also run a construction company. And I would say for both of those things, I have plans. I have a three-year business plan, as I should. I have a three-year plan and a vision for this church, which I should. That is a good thing to have a plan, and we work hard at that. And I see nothing wrong with that, nor do I see anything in the Scripture that gives any indication that there's anything wrong with making plans. But please recognize that those plans are useless to save you and you have very limited control over ensuring those plans actually come to fruition. You have very little control of ensuring that what you plan, that what you've put on a piece of paper or drafted on a vision board or anything like that actually comes true. The good news is that because of Jesus, you can hold those plans, no matter how good they are, very, very loosely because God's plans are infinitely better. Th thank you. Yeah, that's good. Think about this for a second. There's a great freedom and a great joy in making plans and then holding them loosely because God's plan is better. If you would have asked me 10 years ago, what, where did I see myself on this date 10 years later? If you would ask me, like, where do I see myself? I would tell you that this church was not even on my radar. 
If I go back just 10 years, Mission Valley Church was not even anything I was thinking about. Like I literally had no idea that we would have planted a church here. I had no idea that I'd be planting a church with you. I had no idea that I would get an opportunity to be your pastor. I had no idea about any of that. If you would have asked me 10 years ago, where do you see yourself in the church world, like in your, in your spiritual life, where would you see yourself? I, I would have been like, well, I don't know. I'll probably be like serving on a, in a, a Sunday school somewhere. Maybe I'll teach something or maybe I'll be attending. Maybe I'll be the guy that makes the coffee. I don't know. I don't know exactly what I'll be doing. But Mission Valley Church wasn't even in my imagination. And the thing that I want you to know, church, is that I'm so glad that whatever plan I had, I held loosely enough to that I don't even remember what it was because it has allowed me to live in this situation where God is using me and you to make a church that didn't used to be. Isn't that fantastic that we could hold loosely to whatever our plan is so that we can cling tightly to whatever God's plan is? You see, I love this church. I can tell you, just, I just love this church. I'm going to just tell you one cool story about what happens in this church. You guys know that a couple of weeks ago, uh, we had some students that came up here on stage. They were, they were going to go on missions, right? We had Delaney up here, and we had James and Maddie, right? We, and they were going to go on a mission trip to Africa. And this is what happened just last week. They were supposed to fly to Africa. That's what was supposed to happen. That was the plan. And while they were going, Delaney got pulled aside. And they did like a random check and she got stuck. She got stuck in Chicago. They said that she was going to have to wait for a week to get to Africa. And we got a phone call. My wife got a phone call from Delaney on Monday. And Delaney said, hey, they're not going to let me go unless I can come up with $1,500 today to buy a new ticket. And she goes, I don't, I don't know what to do. I think I'm going to have to like not go to Africa this summer. I think I, I got to just not do it. And we were like, no way. Like, there's no way you're not going to go to Africa this summer. Like, surely you, you have a church. Like, you, you're going to Africa. Like, that's not, that's not an option. And so I made a couple of phone calls to a couple of people in the church. First thing I did is I reached out to Brian, who runs our, our finance team. And I said, Brian, do, I mean, do we have the money? And he said, hey, it's, it's, it's not budgeted, but it's in savings. And I said, well, uh, what do you think? And he goes, well, I don't know what it's in savings for if it's not for this kind of thing. And I was like, okay, well, let me check with the elders. And so I reached out to the elders, and they were like, do it. What are you waiting for? And so we called up Delaney and said, hey, you have a church. You're going to Africa. Mission Valley Church is going to take care of that $1,500, and that's done, right? That's fantastic. I'm so glad that we have a church like that. Praise God that she's like, yes, you can get excited. Like you sent somebody to Africa this summer. Like she's over there, like right now. She flew there yesterday. It's so good. And I'm so excited to, ha to, to have a church where we can, we can have that kind of thing going on. But believing that God has this good plan for your life allows you to hold so loosely even to your best plans. I don't know what I was doing 10 years ago, but this is better. Like it really is. I don't, I don't know what else I was doing 10 years. I don't know what I thought I would be doing today. But I'm so glad that this is what I get to do today. Look, I have plans for this church. I see us opening a sin relief center that will serve those in need. I see us building a, a building someday that we will have. And it will be our building. We can be a constant presence in this community. I see us baptizing people who don't know Jesus yet. I see kids like Easton and Kate and Andrew and so many of those other kids over there growing up in this church and having a church where they can be part of. I see all of those things and those are great plans and you can know that I will work my tail off to see those things come to fruition and also I will hold all of those plans very very loosely because God's plans are always better you have good reason to sing today because you can hold loosely to your plans knowing that God's plans are just always going to be better the second thing I want us to know this morning is this we don't know what tomorrow will bring because our days are limited we don't know what tomorrow's going to bring we don't know what's going to happen tomorrow because our days are totally limited look at what it says it says yet you do not know what tomorrow will bring what is your life for you are a mist that appears for a little time and then vanishes and you might say well that's depressing there's a way to read that and be like, well, that's a real bummer. I don't want to think about that. That means I'm going to die someday. You're totally going to die someday. Hey, I don't know if anybody's ever told you this before. I hate to be the one to like break the, the, the news to you. You are totally going to die. Every one of you is going to die someday. Me too. We're all going to die. Did, did, if you didn't know, I'm sorry. Like You didn't come to church to hear that, but that's what's going to happen. We are totally going to die. And you, you might be depressed by that. And some people don't like to think about it. And I know that if I was not a Christian, this would certainly not give me good reason to sing at all. This would be depressing to think that, oh man, I only have so many days and then I die and that's so sad. But it's not depressing as a Christian at all because we are promised eternity. 
What difference does it make if we only have a limited amount of time here? We get eternity. We get, like, forever. Church, think about this for a minute. Eternity goes on forever and ever and ever. Like, if it was a line, it just keeps going. Like, if there was, like, a line from here to eternity, it would just keep on going. Like, where does it end? I, never. It just keeps going. Eternity, it just goes on and on and on. And your life here, like, lasts somewhere under 110 years, somewhere in that range. Like, that's kind of probably what you're going to get out of this place. Whether it's a good life or a bad life, whether it's a happy life or a a sad life, it's probably relatively insignificant from an eternal perspective. As James said, your life is a mist. It goes by so quickly. You know how quickly life goes by, especially if you have kids. I was talking to Bailey the other day. I, I met Kobe for coffee, and Bailey came with him. And so she was there, and I said, hey, how's Andrew doing? And she said, he's doing so good, but he's like a little boy now. He used to be a baby, and now he's a little boy. And I was like, man, that happened so fast. And she said, yeah, it happened so fast. Like one day he's a baby, and like now he's like a little boy. And I totally related to that because I was thinking I used to have a little boy too, but now he's like a full-grown man, and he's over in Africa on this mission trip, and other little kids are coming up to him. Life goes by so quickly, it is a mist. And when it's over here, when it's over here, whatever amount of time you get down here, whenever it's over here, then eternity begins where you get to spend all of it forever in the presence of Jesus. Like whatever amount of time you get here is just a mist. And then you get the rest of it, all of eternity, all of it, you get to hang out with Jesus. And this is amazing news. This is glorious news. This is sing loud, worthy news. Look, this world is broken. And even on your very, very best day, if you took your very best day here on earth, it took the very best moment out of the very best day that you had here on earth, that is only a glimpse. It is a glimmer. It is a shadow of how fantastic eternity is going to be. And so the fact that we have limited time here is actually awesome. Church, I want you to know that you have good reason to sing today because your days on this broken world are limited, but your days in heaven with Jesus will be limitless. That's good news. That is really, really good news. Third thing out of today's text is this. We don't know what tomorrow will bring, so subject yourself to God's will. We really don't know what tomorrow will bring, and because of that, we can subject, our, subject ourselves to his will. This is what it says in verse 15. It says, instead, you ought to say, if the Lord wills, we will live and do this or that. James, again, addressing these people. He's addressing these people that are making plans. They're, they're making these plans, and it's good that they have these plans. And he's saying, hey, instead of being so concerned with your plans, just subject yourself to God's will. What if you started every morning by saying, God, thank you for this morning. Whatever you would have me do today, let me do that really well. That is subjecting ourselves to God's will. And James is encouraging us to do that. God will, God's will is always going to happen anyway. He's God. And so instead of fighting against his plan, what if we would just subject ourselves to it? Instead of fighting against God's plan, what if we would just subject his, ourselves to it? Uh, church, think about this. I'm telling you that there is so much peace in just subjecting yourself to God's will, to submitting to God's will, to saying, God, I, I think I have a plan for what to do here, but whatever you will, let's do that. That'll probably be better than what I wanted to do anyway. God, I was thinking I might do this thing, but hey, what do you have for me? Because whatever you've got is just going to be better. And instead, as Christians, what we tend to do is we tend to, tend to try to pull power back from God. We try to say, well, I don't really like the way that you're doing it, God, so let me, let me just take the wheel back from you. Let me like kind of jerk back uh, control of my life because I don't, really, I don't really want you to have it. And here James is saying, no, just give it up to God. Just subject yourself to his will. Uh, it's kind of like this. When I was a little kid, I would go to Ohio every summer. My dad had a sailboat. If you've never been on a sailboat before, they kind of function by like the wind blows into the sails and then you get to take the boat where you want to go. And this is pretty cool unless you are trying to sail directly at where the wind's coming from. Like if you're trying to sail a boat in front, and to that spot over there and the wind is coming from that spot, it's really hard to get there. Now, you can do it, but what you have to do is you have to like kind of go this way into the wind and then back way into the wind, and you have to just tack back and forth and back and forth and back and forth, and it takes forever to get anywhere because you are fighting the will of the wind. It is, you're fighting to, to, to go into the, the, the direction it doesn't want you to go, and it's exhausting, and it takes forever, and this is what happens when we are fighting God's will for our life. I will talk to people before that will be like, man, I know what God wants me to do, but I don't want to do it. Maybe you can relate to that. Like, I know what God's calling me to do, but I don't want to do it. And I'm always like, oh, you're totally going to have to do that eventually. You should probably just get on with it, 
right? Like that's what's going to happen. Like there was a point in time where I came to my wife and I was like, hey, honey, I, I think maybe I'm supposed to be a pastor. And she's like, no way. Like I'm, we're not, you're not a pastor. I'm not a pastor's wife. I don't want to do that. And I was like, yeah, you're right. That sounds lame. Let's not do that. And like 15 years later, guess what? I became a pastor. Like we should have just said yes in the beginning. It would have been better, right? We are, we are to subject ourselves to God's will because this is what's going to happen. God's will is going to win out. Do you really think you're going to outwill God? Like, do you really think you're going to outwill God? Like, it just doesn't happen. Like, you can't do it. He's going to win out. And so we just subject ourselves to it. Now, in the sailboat analogy, there would be this time we'd be fighting back and forth, fighting against the wind. And what was always really cool is when you would just sail with the wind. When you would just sail with the wind, you would turn the boat around, go whatever direction the wind wanted you to go, and it was like lemonade and snack time. I mean, it was fantastic. And I'm not telling you that when you are sitting in God's will for your life that it'll all be lemonade and snacks. Sometimes you'll do hard stuff. We have a family here that is literally moving to Michigan to plant a church. I didn't know they were coming. They just showed up. There's a church planting family that's here today with us. They are moving to Michigan to plant a church. And I promise you, there's going to be some lemonade and snacks, but it's going to be hard as all get out. I mean, it's going to be super hard. They're going to go try to make a church where there's not a church, and that's going to be so hard. But it's going to be so fantastic because that's what God is willing them to do, and they've just subjected themselves to it. In church, if we would just subject ourselves to God's will, it would be fantastic for us because his will is always better. It's always better. Church, you know that God's plan is better for you, right? You know that he has written a better story for your life than you could ever imagine. And there is great freedom in just submitting to that. There is great freedom in recognizing I've gotten my life off track from the way that you want me to go, God, and so I'm going to repent and get back on track. Church, I want you to know that you have good reason to sing because you can freely submit to a God who has good plans for your life. He's got good plans for your life. It's okay to just be like, hey, I, you know what, God, what do you, what do you want? Let's do it. You see, we don't know what tomorrow will bring, so we don't need to be arrogant about it. When I look at this text today, this is kind of my favorite part of the whole sermon, this idea that we don't know what tomorrow will bring, so we don't have to be arrogant about it. Listen to what it says in the text. It says, as it is, you boast in your arrogance. All such boasting is evil. James says, you so much don't know what tomorrow will bring that you have no business boasting and bragging about it. And I know that this world rewards this kind of thing. I know in this world, we, re we, we reward boasting and bragging. We reward the people that say, hey, I got this all figured out. I know exactly what I'm going to do. And James is saying, hey, for the Christian, you don't have to do that. You don't have to brag about tomorrow. You don't have to boast about tomorrow. We love it when Apple releases some kind of a keynote saying that the new iPhone 2012 is going to change our lives. And we love that kind of thing. We get all excited about it. We love it when President Kennedy said, hey, we're going to put a man on the moon before the end of the decade. We love it when Babe Ruth points to the outfit. Field and, and lets everybody know he's going to hit a home run or when Joe Namath guarantees that he's going to win the Super Bowl. We love it and we remember it and we tell stories about it. But you know what? In the grand scheme of things, it hardly ever happens. In the grand scheme of things, it hardly ever happens that those that are bragging about these things actually see them work out. It hardly ever happens. You know how many guys guarantee victories and then lose? You know how many businesses set out every year to make a profit and then don't do it? You know how many people set out with really good plans and then it just doesn't go well at all? And what James is saying is, hey, you don't have to boast about it because the truth is you don't really know. You don't have to do that. Most of the boasting that people are doing is trying to will it to happen or fake it into happening. And James is saying, stop it. You don't have to because you don't know. And you could look at this in a kind of a down way. Again, you could look at it and think, well, this is bad. But when I look at this text, it gives me good reason to sing because it means that I don't have to have it all figured out. I think there's just like this, this desire in the world right now that people should have everything all figured out, that we should know exactly what we're going to do tomorrow or next week or next month or next year or whatever. And the text today is telling us, hey, you're not going to know anyway. And so enjoy that freedom of just not knowing. 
There is freedom in just not knowing exactly what's going to happen. I don't know exactly how this is going to work out. I don't know. I'm going to take this new job. Are you going to keep it forever? I don't know. I, I, I don't know. I, I, maybe I am. Maybe I'm not. I'm going to go to this school. Are you, are you, is that where you're going to stay? Are you going to stay in this school forever? I, I don't know. Maybe I'm going to do that. Maybe I'm not. There is freedom in that. Otherwise, we have to sort of fake it till we make it. I saw this article this week. I was reading this article, and it said that over 32% of 18 to 30-year-olds feel like they are faking it every day in their job. Over 32% of young people are saying, we don't know what we're doing, but we're afraid to tell anybody, and so we're just faking it until we figure it out. And this is what I want to say as a 43-year-old, if you're in that category, we don't know either. We're just lying about it. We don't know either. You want to have a clue how much you don't know? Have a kid. You bring this kid home and it's like, man, I don't know anything anymore. And this kid lets me know every single day. I, I know less and less. Like, I don't know anything about I got like, I got teenage daughters. I have become a stupid man. Like, I'm really, like, I don't know anything about stuff. It's hard. They, these girls are, they're smart. I want you to know that this idea of trying to figure it out, like you know everything, literally pretending to know all this stuff that you don't know is exhausting. It's got to be exhausting, and it's okay if you don't have it all figured out yet. Neither did anybody else. Church, I don't think I could stand up here for 10 minutes if I had to pretend I have this all figured out. I really don't. I don't think I could stand up here in front of you if I could just, just sit here and pretend like, hey, oh, yeah, you know what? Just listen to Mike Lee. He's got it all figured out. Man, I don't have hardly anything figured out. I'm just like you. I'm just going along, trying to do God's will the best I can every single day. And that's what I'm doing. And that's what we should all be doing. Here's the truth. I'm a sinner and I screw up all the time. It is literally only Jesus in me that produces anything good. And people say, well, what's next for the church or what's next for your business or whatever? And I say, well, here's what I'm planning for, but, but it's in God's hands and so I'm going to work to his will. Church, you have good reason to sing today because you don't have to be arrogant or fake it until you make it. Can you get that? Can you get the freedom in knowing that in Jesus you don't have to fake it? You don't have to boast? You don't have to be arrogant? You don't have to put a show on for anybody? You can just say, I'm just doing the best I can today. There's so much freedom in that. Can you just feel the weight of that just coming off your shoulder? You don't have to have it all figured out. And because you don't have to worry so much about what tomorrow is going to bring, you can focus on what you're supposed to be doing today. Maybe this is the most freeing thing in this entire text. This idea that if we will let go of worrying so much about what's going to happen tomorrow, that we could just focus in on today. Do you ever just stop and think, what is it that I should be doing today? Or do you get yourself too far out worrying about what I'm going to be doing tomorrow? Here's what I want us to know. Sort of the fifth idea this morning is this. We don't know what tomorrow will bring, so do the good work God has set before you today. You don't have to worry so much about the future. You can do what God has for you today. This is what it says in the text. It says, so whoever knows the right thing to do and fails to do it, for him it is sin. So we're supposed to do the right thing that we know to do and not do things that would be, and not doing it would just be sinful. Okay, so good, that's good. We're supposed to be doing this good thing. What is it the good thing that we're supposed to be doing? You do know the good work you're supposed to be doing, right? You do know the good work that you're supposed to be doing. If you are a believer in the life, death, and resurrection of Jesus, you do know what your number one mission is, right? We talk about it here a lot. You do know what you are supposed to be doing. We talk about it here oftentimes. It's the reason that we made a church. Here is what we are supposed to be doing. This is the good work that is before us today. It's in Matthew 28, 18 through 20. It is Jesus giving us the most clear mission statement of all times when he said, all authority in heaven and earth has been given to me. Go, therefore, and make Make disciples of all nations, baptizing them in the name of the Father and the Son and the Holy Spirit, teaching them to observe all that I have commanded you. And behold, I am with you always to the end of the age. That is it. That is the good work that you are supposed to be doing. That is the good work that is set before you. That is the good work that you are free to worry less about all of this stuff in the future and focus today on that good work. That is the work that Jesus should find us doing when he comes back or calls us home. Church, think about this for a second. How fantastic is it to know that we don't have to know exactly what tomorrow will bring because we know exactly what we're supposed to be doing today. It is unbelievably good news to know, hey, I don't have to figure out 10 years from now because I know exactly what I'm supposed to be doing today. 
We can make all kinds of plans about what we're going to do in a year, two years, six months, a hundred years, whatever. We can make all kinds of plans, and maybe they'll work out and maybe they won't. But we know what we're supposed to be doing today because Jesus himself made sure that we would know, that we would know exactly what we're supposed to be spending our time with. What are you going to be doing in 10 years? I don't know. But today, I'm going to go teach baptized. Okay, but what are you going to be doing next year? Well, I don't really know what I'm going to be doing next year. But today, I'm going to go teach and baptize. Okay, but what are you going to be, what are your plans for next month? Well, I don't really know next month. Heck, I don't know that Jesus isn't coming back tomorrow. So today, I'm going to go teach, make disciples, and baptize. Church, what if we are wasting time making plans to accomplish the wrong things 10 years from now when we ought to be more focused on the good work we have before us today, which is to go teach, and baptize? What if we're just wasting time on plans that'll never come to fruition when we know that we have good work to do today? Church, I am concerned that we are not taking this seriously enough. I'm concerned that as Christians, we're not taking seriously enough the call for today And we're focusing too much on the call for a decade from now. I'm concerned that we are taking 10, 20, or 30 years from now more seriously than the mission Jesus himself has given us for today. And if we would throw ourselves into the main thing that Jesus has called us to do, to go, to teach, to baptize, I bet we'll be far less concerned and fixated on what comes after that. I've been just loving this, uh, the, just having a kid that's over on mission right now uh, as part of this team because I'm getting like just like little snippets of what he's doing over there, right? This is, what, this is what I'm getting. He's getting little snippets over there. And he's a planner. I mean, that kid's a planner. You know, like if there's like a planner and a not planner get married, like the kids are going to probably be like one of them. And he's, he's a planner. He's totally a planner. But what he is so focused on and fixated on every single day is that he has a very limited amount of time with these kids that he is growing to love. And what he wants to do before he leaves is make sure that he has shared the gospel with them and prays that they believe. He doesn't know how long he's going to get with them. Max, he's going to get two months. And so he's spending all of his time thinking about how can I leverage every single bit of my day. Like, I don't have so much time to call, Mom. I don't have so much time to call, Dad. I, can't, like, I don't have a lot of time for that because what I'm doing here is this work. I got this work to do, and I have a short amount of time to do it. And I'm thinking to myself as I'm watching him do this that we would all be better off to live a lot more like that. What am I focused on today? What am I trying to get done today? Because tomorrow just is not guaranteed. Church, you have good reason to sing because you know the good work that God has called you to. You see, I think we wouldn't have good reason to sing if we didn't know what it is that we were supposed to be doing. If we were walking around here every day like confused, like I don't know what I'm supposed to be doing. What am I supposed to be doing in my life right now? I don't know what I'm supposed to be doing. We know exactly what we're supposed to be doing because Jesus told us. Here is the thing. We don't know what tomorrow will bring, but God does. He knows exactly what it's going to bring. God knows exactly what's going to happen. He has already written it. It is done. It is finished. He knows what's going to happen. And the cool thing is is that if you're willing to look out far enough, you can know what it's going to bring too, at least to an extent. If you're willing to just look out far enough, get past like your life and just look out far enough, you can know what it'll bring too. If you will read just the back of the the Bible just here at the end, you can just open it up. Revelation 21, 1 through 7 tells us what's eventually going to happen. This is what it says. It says, then I saw a new heaven and a new earth for the first heaven and the first earth had passed away and the sea was no more. And I saw the holy city, new Jerusalem coming down out of heaven from God, prepared as a bride adorned for her husband. And I heard a loud voice from the throne and saying, Behold, the dwelling place of God is with man. Where is man going to be? With God. And where is God going to be? With man. The dwelling place of God is with man. He will himself be with them as their God. He will wipe away every tear from their eye, and death shall be no more. Neither there shall be mourning, nor crying, nor pain anymore, for the former things have passed away. And he who was seated on the throne said, Behold, I am making all things new. Also he said, Write this down, for these words are trustworthy and true. And he said to me, It is done. I am the Alpha and the Omega, the beginning and the end. To the thirsty I will give from the spring of the water of life without payment. The one who conquers will have this heritage, and I will be his God. God, and he will be my son. And this is what's going to happen if you look out far enough. And so you don't have to worry so much about what you're going to do when you're 58 years old. Because you know where you're going to spend eternity. 
And you don't have to worry so much about what you're going to do next month or next year or your three-year plan. You can hold loosely to all of that because the one who has written the stars in the sky knows exactly where you're going to spend eternity if you can believe. If you can believe. If you can believe in the life, death, and resurrection of Jesus, your future is completely secured. And the only place that it matters to be secured. And so you can hold the things of this life loosely, focusing on the good work that it is you are to be doing. Church, we have good work in front of us. We don't have to go to Africa to run into people that do not know the gospel. We can be right here in our city, in our neighborhood, in our places of work, and meet people that do not know the gospel. This is the work we are called to do. To go to them and tell them the good news. To tell them how God made the world and it was perfect. And it was beautiful and it worked exactly like it was supposed to. And then man sinned and when we sinned we broke it. And now we live in a broken world. And the very, very worst part of the brokenness of this world is that it it causes a separation between sinners like us and a perfect God. But that God loved us so much that he wouldn't leave us in that sinful state. He wouldn't leave us in that separated state. And so he sent Jesus down here. Jesus literally left heaven to come down to earth to live the perfect life that you and I never could. Die the horrific death that you and I deserve and defeat that death so that anyone who would believe in him could spend eternity with him. So that anyone who would believe in him doesn't have to worry so much about figuring it all out right here on earth because their eternity is secured. And you and I know people that don't know that. And it is our job, it is our responsibility, it is our privilege, it is our call, it is our mission to go to them and tell them so that they could believe. The scripture says, how will they know if they don't hear? And how will they hear if someone doesn't go? The scripture says, how beautiful are the feet that bring good news. Church, i got to be honest with you. I'm just being your pastor. I'm going to be honest with you. I don't care what you're going to be doing in 10 years. I care who you're going to talk to today about Jesus. I don't care what you're going to be doing 30 years from now. I don't care about your retirement plans. I care about who's the next person you're going to baptize. Because that is the work that is set before us now. And if you are here today and you have never believed the gospel that I shared, I desperately want you to believe that today. And if you have believed, I want you to hold so much looser to your plans so that you can so much tighter embrace God's. It takes belief to do that. It takes unbelievable belief to say, God, your ways are so much better, and so I'm going to hold my plans with open hands so that I can grab firmly to your plans. Can you believe today? Can you believe? Let's pray. God, we thank you for your word, and we thank you that your ways are infinitely better than our ways. That your ways are infinitely better than our ways. And God, we confess that sometimes we try to pull control back from you. We try to assert our will over our own lives instead of submitting to yours. And so, God, we repent for that. God, help us to believe anew so that we can cling to your plans and hold loosely to ours. And God, if there's anybody in this room today who has never believed in you, who has never believed in your life, death, and resurrection, God, we ask you to save them. It's in your name that we pray. Amen. Hey, church, uh, I want to reintroduce you to somebody uh, very special. Uh, Devin is back with us this summer. If you remember last year, yeah, look, everybody's all excited. Oh, welcome home. Yeah, if you remember last summer, uh, there was a whole group of students that were here, part of Gen Sen. Uh, there was a group of them, they came out, and this is what happens when students hang out with us. They're like, hey, we're coming back. Like, we're all coming back. We, we just can't wait to all come back. But like, Devin like, was like serious. She was like really serious. Like, everybody says it, but then like, you actually came back. And so you drove here, you spent 25 hours driving here from Alabama all the way to Phoenix, and you said you really liked Louisiana, driving through that part of the country. It was beautiful. And so she's happy to be here. Uh, church, I just want you to know that Devin is here. She's going 
going to be with us all summer. She's going to predominantly be working with Janine uh, and doing things in the Connections team to work in the community. Be hands and feet. Uh, this was really cool. When Devin said she was coming, we were trying to figure out where we were going to put her because we have another group of Gen Send students that are coming next week. We'll introduce them to you next week. But Devin's going to come. She's going to be spending some time with them, working with them. But we needed her here in the community. We needed her close. And so I asked like just a family in the church, hey, do you have an extra room? They said, of course. So you got to have a place to live all summer. So that's pretty cool. All right. Very, very good. And we're so happy about it. Uh, and there's going to be a lot of different opportunities for you to get to know Devin better, work with Devin more, invite her over to your house for dinner, like whatever you're into, take her out to lunch. She likes that kind of stuff. Um, but mostly what we want to do is just be praying for the work that she's doing. She is very, uh, very clear on what she's doing here. She's here to be the hands and feet of Jesus. That's what she's going to be doing. And so we get to partner with her and with Jesus to do that. So please welcome Devin. She's going to be out in the courtyard after service. Thank you so much. Thanks, Devin. She was really concerned she was going to have to talk. She doesn't have to talk. Before I have Brian uh, uh, do announcements, which is going to be great, uh, if, you, if you just want to get some holy on you, go stand next to Brian at some point today. This is a good dude right here. Um, we'll talk more about Brian later. But this one I want to do real quick. I didn't know this was happening, but we have a church planting family uh, that's here, and they are, they're going to be here this Sunday with us. I didn't know they were going to be here, but they are here, and they are going to go to Michigan to plant a church. They're literally going to make a church where they didn't used to be a church. And so I want to take just a minute and pray for them. Uh, Thomas and Allie Amos and their family uh, have been wonderful servants of the Lord and they are going to do a new thing and we're super excited about it. And so church, I just want to pray for them real quick together. Uh, Thomas, are you back there? Thomas, run up here real quick. Don't act like you're like not like going to do that. Come on up here. Thomas, get up here. This is cool. Uh, what's that? That's fine. Should be all right. Uh, Allie, are you back there too? Allie, there you are. Thomas, uh, how can we be praying for you specifically? Did I mention a four-year-old? Yeah, you do have yeah, a four-year-old, yeah. Yeah, yeah uh, um, we move Wednesday, yeah. and so we're the last member of our team to get out there. Um, and I don't know that you know this, we're actually going to plant like 10 churches. Yeah, just 10. Just yeah, just 10. a small number. We want to start off something easy. Yeah, yeah. Like, you know, don't boast yeah. about tomorrow. Yeah. <laughs> this is harder than it looks. I'm not trying to boast. No, I no, no, no. Plan. Yeah, I really yeah, yeah, yeah. It's good to have a plan, though. But no, so we're going to a, um, a part of Michigan that, just to be honest with you, from an outsider, feels like it was abandoned by churches. So just pray that. Well, I'm going to get emotional about this. Place. I guess I'm, you'll do I'm that. Not kind even of thing. There you'll yet. do that. Um, Oakland County, Michigan, for those people um, to be open to the gospel. That's the whole reason we're going. I mean, there's a lot of other stuff, you know to come along with that, but that's the main reason we're headed out there is so that, so this area that the surrounding churches refer to as a gospel ghost town, just, there's no, Christ isn't known there, and so that, pray that those people would be ready to hear the gospel and open to following Christ. Very, very good. Church, let's pray uh, for, for Thomas and, and Allie in this group. Lord God, we do thank you for, uh, for servants that are willing to go out and live on the, the mission that you've given them. Lord, we ask that you would go uh, before Thomas and Allie and their whole team, that you would start to already soften the hearts of these people that don't know the gospel, that they would come to know you, that through this church and through this church plant, that more churches uh, would be planted, that more gospel uh, presentations would happen, that more people would believe and get baptized, and that, Lord, that there would be no no place, uh, that there would be no place uh, that would be referred to as a gospel ghost town uh, anymore, Lord, that, uh, that your, your word would fill uh, the entire word, world. It's in your name that we pray. Amen. All right. Thanks, buddy. Amen.